All right, everyone. Welcome to our new series on Python. And in this series, I plan to cover all the basics of Python, from variables to loops to functions, everything. And by the end of the series, you should be up and running with Python, know the basics, and be able to go into any field of Python you want. With Python, you can create games, make websites, and use data manipulation for various fields. Now, before we get started, let's understand where all of this coding is going to take place. Instead of the traditional way of downloading the Python app, I'll be using the online coding platform REPL.it. This will allow anyone to experiment with Python without having to go through the download process. However, you can still follow along with the code if you have the Python app. So to access REPL, all you have to do is search REPL.it in your browser and then make an account to save your files. Next, create a REPL by clicking in the top left-hand corner, the plus new REPL and select Python as the language from the drop-down menu. You also have a name option and you can name your REPL whatever you want, but for our, our purposes, we'll just name it Python Basics. And there we go, this REPL will load and that's it. You're ready to get started in Python. Thank you so much for picking this course and let's get ready to begin your Python journey. Hello and welcome back everyone. So now that we have REPL set up, let's start writing Python. So the first thing we're going to do is learn how to write hello world. To do this, we are going to write print and then in the two parentheses, we will have quotation marks. Now in those quotation marks, we will write hello world. We'll click run and then boom, out prints hello world. Now we can also do the same thing here in the console and you will see we sometimes switch from writing in the console to writing in the workspace. Sometimes it's just easier to write in the console because when you're writing in the file, you have to write print all the time to check for values. But if you just follow along with what I do, everything will be easy to understand and it all makes sense. All right. So now that we want, now what we want to do is create a variable. Variables are basically just stores of data. For example, I can write name equals harsh in quotation marks. This is basically just saying that the variable name is assigned to the string harsh. The quotation marks indicate that harsh is a string and a string is basically just a block of characters. The single equal sign shows that the string harsh is assigned to the variable name. So now if I print name, it will print harsh. You can think of variables as substitutes of the actual value. Similarly, we can also assign the variable age to 16. Notice that there is no quotations around 16 because that is an integer, so that doesn't require quotation marks. Now, we have age as, as assigned to 16. We can check that by printing age in the workspace, or if I'm writing my code in the console, I can simply type age and I'll get 16 out. And that's all there is to variables. You assign a variable some value, and then you can use that variable instead of the actual value, which will allow you to change your code easily in the future if the need arises. Now, Python also has a feature called multiple assignment. Suppose I had friends called Bob, Jack, and Sarah. I can manually write all of their ages out, Bob equals 16, and then Jack equals 18, and then finally Sarah equals 20. But with the multiple assignment feature, I can assign all of the ages in a single line. All you have to do is write Bob, comma, Jack, comma, Sarah equals 16, comma, 18, comma, 20. And then you can check their respective values by typing Jack or Sarah in the console and printing them out in, or, or printing them out in the workspace. Now, suppose all these people had the same age. Once again, you don't want to manually write out all of the ages. So you can also do Sarah equals Bob equals Jack equals 17. And once again, we can check and make sure that everyone got the right value. And that's the power of multiple assignment. It saves time and also makes your code a lot easier to read and write. Now, I have a quick challenge for you. Try, try to, in one line, create a variable for your name and your age. So pause this video right here and then come back to check your answer. Great, now that you have attempted this challenge, let's learn how to tackle this problem. The challenge was to create a variable for your name and your age in one line. And to do this, you will have name comma age equals your quotation marks, your name, which in this case I'm just taking to be Bob, comma 16, which in this case is also an example. 
Now, since Bob is a string, it will be in quotation marks. Bob will come first because you're assigning a value to the variable name first, and then you will have 16, which is going to be separated by a comma. And you can also write them independently to check and get the value you want. So I can write name, and I'll get Bob, and I can write uh, age, and I'll get 16. And there you have it, variables and multiple assignments. Now that we talked about variables and how they work in the last video, it's time to move on to arithmetic operators and strings. So when I say arithmetic operators, I'm talking about basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. This time, I'll use the console to show you the basic operators. Here, we can start off by doing 5 plus 5 to get 10. Then we can do 10 minus 5 to get 5. And next, from multiplication, we can do 5 asterisk 5 to get 25. The asterisk, you can, get, you can get that from pressing the Shift-8 key. And then for division, we'll use the forward slash. Note that it is important that you use the forward slash, as using the backward slash will get you an error. So here we can do 10 forward slash 5 to get 2. And like I said, if I do 10 backward slash 5, as you can see, I'll get an error. Now, I did all of this with integers, but we can also do this with variables. Let's create the variable x and set it to 5. And then let's create the variable y and set it to 10. We can do all the same operations using the variables. And don't think, don't think that we can only do one operation at a time. For example, I can do x times y and then we can divide it by 2. Python will just follow the rules for the order of operations. Now, there's one more operator that you see in Python, although it is not as common as the other operators and it's called the modulus operator, and is denoted by a person sign, which you can get by pressing shift five. So what the modulus operator do does is that it gives you the remainder of an operation. For example, we can do 10 modulus two and get zero, because 10 goes into two five times and there is no remainder. But if we do 10 modulus three, you will see that we get a result of one because there's a remainder of one when you do 10 divided by three. And like the other operators, this can also be used with variables. Now, another neat thing with Python is that you can actually use some of these operators with strings as well as with integers. For example, let's say you create a string called first name where you put your name. So I would put my name in quotation marks as harsh and then another string called last name, which I would put in quotation marks as karya. Now, if you write first name plus last name, then you get harsh karya. However, just notice that there is no space between my first and last name. Using this method, you will have to manually insert the space between the first and last name by adding a string with just the space. You can also multiply strings. For example, I can multiply first name by three to get my first name repeated three times. But you have to be careful because you can't multiply two strings together, nor can you use subtraction, division, or modulus operators with the strings. So there you have it, the basic arithmetic operators in Python. Now, before I end this video, I want to show another cool tool in Python. Let's say that I write a sentence, um, sentence equals, I like to play tennis. Now, let's say that I want a specific part of the sentence. Let's say I want the word I. Well, in Python, there's a feature called indexing or splicing. So to get that part of the sentence, I can write sentence square brackets zero, now you might be wondering why I wrote zero. Well, this is because in Python and other coding languages, the number system starts at zero. So by splicing the zero character, we will get the letter I. Now, suppose I want the phrase I like. To do that, we will write the sentence, we'll write sentence square brackets zero colon six. Now here's another important part of splicing. The spaces count as characters and the last number you put in the square brackets will be excluded in the result. So suppose I did sentence square bracket zero colon five, then I'm missing the last character of like. Also, if you're starting from zero, the zero character, then you can just write the colon and the ending position. You don't really have to write zero. And you can also splice in the negative direction. For example, you can say sentence colon negative two, and I will get everything in the sentence except the last two characters. Using splicing, you can take a specific segment of a string, 
and that proves really useful in the future. And there you have it, the basic arithmetic operators and strings. In this video, we'll talk about placeholders. Hopefully, all of you already know what placeholders are. So let's say that I have a friend called Jake. So name equals quotation marks Jake. Now, if I want to say that Jake is 15 years old, I can say name plus quotation marks space is 15 years old and I get what I want. But this is quite time consuming. Instead, we can use placeholders. However, it is important to note that every placeholder needs to specify the data type, whether it's strings or integers or some other data type. So let's create a variable called sent equals um, is 15 years old. And then at the start of this, we can add the percent %s. So that's shift five and then s, which signifies that the placeholder is for a string. Now, what you can do is sent percent name. You can, you can write sent percent name and you will get Jake is 15 years old. I could also say sent percent parentheses, for example, Cody to get Cody is 15 years old. So basically what it's doing is it's letting Python know that we're inputting Cody as the placeholder for the string. Now, what if there were two placeholders? Well, that works too. All we have to do is specify two placeholders. For example, we want to say that someone is the president of the United States. We can get, we can set sentence equals percent %s space percent %s is the president of the United States. This will allow us to input the first and last name of any president. Now we can easily go ahead and say sentence percent, we can do Joe comma Biden to get the sentence Joe Biden is the president of the United States. I showed you placeholders for string, but what if I want to use integers? Let's say I want to say that Jake is some number of years old. For integers, the placeholder symbol is percent %d. So we can go ahead and set sent equals percent %s space per is, is percent %d years old. Now we can do sent percent and in parentheses we can do Jake as a string comma 16 and we will get Jake is 16 years old. And that's basically what placeholders are. They help you to leave spaces in your code so that you can easily go in and fill fill, a, fill in a variable that may be changed in the future. They make sure that your code is not hard coded and then you can easily go and modify it whenever you need. And that's basically it. Hey everyone and welcome back to the Python development series. In the last video, we went over placeholders and this time we'll be going over lists. Python lists are similar to lists in regular life. They're basically a series of components that are separated by commas. Instead of making an independent variable for each item, lists allow us to efficiently organize different items together. For example, if I want to create a shopping list, I can say shop list equals in square brackets apples, oranges, bananas, bananas and cherries. We can also call a particular item of a list. If you remember, a few videos ago I said that in code, counting starts from zero. That applies to lists as well, except this time it applies to each item and not each character. So if I index the zero value from shop list by doing shop list square bracket zero, I'll get apples and not just a. You can think of it as each item in the list can be indexed and the index value um, will be the place of the item minus one. So apples will be zero because they're first in the list and one minus one is zero. And then oranges will be two minus one um, and that will become one and so on. You can also index multiple items. For example, if I want apples and oranges, I can do shop list zero colon two to get apples and oranges. Remember though that the ending position is excluded. So if you want to go up to bananas, you will have to do shop list zero colon three. Now let's talk about modifying lists. Well, lists are what we call mutable, so the nice thing about them is that they can be changed. For that, we can use the append function. For example, if we want to add blueberries to our list, we can say shop append, and then in parentheses and quotation marks, blueberries. And then you can see that blueberries has been added to the list. 
Now, instead of adding an item, let's say you want to replace an existing item. Suppose that you want to remove apples and instead buy cheese. Well, you can do that by indexing shop list 0 and then making it equal to cheese. And the list will be modified accordingly. So we can add and replace items in a list, but can we delete items? Yes. To delete an item in a list, you have to use the delete function. All you have to do is write delete, which is just del, and then shop list, and then the index value of the item you want to delete. Say you want to delete oranges, so you can say del shop list 1 to get rid of oranges. And now let's say you want to know how many items are in the list, and you can use that. You can use the length function to figure that out as well. You can do length, which is just len in Python, and then in parentheses shop list to get how many items are in a list, which in this case are four. Note, however, that the length function does not count from zero and actually starts from one. Another cool feature in lists is that you can also add two lists together. So. Let's create another list and we will call it shop list 2 and we'll make it equal to bread, butter and jam. Now we can do shop list plus shop list 2 to get the combined two lists. And like we learned in the arithmetic operators video, you can also multiply lists to have them repeat. For example, you can do shop list times 3 and times will be the asterisk, don't forget. Then there are two more functions. Um, that lists have the max and min functions that we we'll also be touching on in this video. For those functions to work, we need a list made of just numbers. So first of all, let's create a list called list num. And in that list we'll be doing, we'll just have it be 1, 8, 2, 6, and then 25. That's a random order of numbers. Now to find the maximum value of this list, all we have to do is do the do max and then in parentheses list num to get 25, which is our maximum value of the list. And then we can also do the minimum, which is min list num, also in parentheses, and we'll get one, which is the minimum value of this list. And that's it for list. Um, that's list in a nutshell. So yeah, thank you for watching and make sure to stay tuned for the next video. Hey everyone and welcome back. In this video, we will discuss dictionaries. So what are dictionaries? Well, in the real world, dictionaries are books that give you different words and their definition. Um, dictionaries in Python are somewhat similar. In Python, every dictionary has a key and then a value. For example, let's say we want to store the name and the age of a few people. If we were to do this using a list, it would be students and we'll just set the list students equals square brackets Bob in quotation marks and then comma 12 which will be his age and then Rachel in quotation marks comma 13 which is her age and then Emily in quotation marks comma 15 which is her age. Now if I want to identify what Rachel's age is I will first have to identify where Rachel is in the list and then look at the next value to see her age. This is both inefficient and ineffective and that's where dictionaries come in. So let's create a dictionary with the same values. To create a dictionary, we need to use curly brackets, which you can get by pressing shift and then the square bracket keys. So let's do students equal Bob. And uh, so students equal Bob and then Bob will be 12. And then Bob again is going to be in quotation marks because that's a string. And then you'll have a colon separating Bob and then 12. And then when you move on to the next person, you'll be separating that with a comma. So after 12, you'll just write comma space Rachel and then colon 13, comma, space, Emily, colon 15. Note that I have colons between the name and the age. This is because the name is the key and the age is the value. So Bob is the key and 12 is the value. Now I want to find out how old Rachel is. To do that, I will type students and then square brackets and then the key. So students, square brackets, Rachel in quotation marks and then enter. And this is going to be in the console, just letting you know. And there I get Rachel's age. Same thing with Bob. We can we will get 12. Now let's say that Rachel is, has turned 15. We can change Rachel's age the same way we accessed it. So we'll just do students, square brackets, Rachel in quotation mark, and then we'll just set that equal to 15. And now if you print out students, we'll get that Rachel is, has been changed to 15. We can also delete a key value pair from the dictionary. Let's say that Emily left the school. Well, 
to remove her, all I have to do is use the delete function by typing delete or del and students and then um, Emily in quotation marks and square brackets. And then when we print the dictionary again, Emily will no longer be there. You can also find the length of a dictionary by typing len and then students in parentheses. So len parentheses students and we can see that there are two items in my dictionary. One important thing to know about dictionaries is that you cannot have multiple keys correspond to different values or to the same value. For example, I have three bobs in the, in the class. A dictionary like this, students equals uh, curly brackets bob, who's one bob who is 12, and then one bob who's 14, and then one bob who's 16. That should not exist. Because now if I access the value of bob, Python doesn't know which bob I'm talking about, and it will give me the last value that I entered, which in this case is 16 year old bob. So whenever you use dictionaries, make sure that each key value pair is unique, and yeah, that's what you have to be looking out for. And that's basically it for dictionaries. I hope you enjoyed the video and see you in the next one. Hey everyone and welcome back to the Python course and today we'll be going over tuples. So tuples will be the last of the basic data structures that we'll be learning in this course. Tuples are similar to lists as they are sequences, but unlike lists, they are immutable. That means that tuples cannot be modified once they've been created. So to create a tuple, let's do tuple equals parentheses. Um, we use normal parentheses for tuples. So now let's populate our tuple with um, grocery items. So let's say tuple equals parentheses oranges, comma apples, comma bananas. And there, now we can print it to check. So now, like I said, tuples cannot be changed. So if I want to say that tube zero, or like if I index the first term, I can do tube zero or the first value of the tuple um, should become cherries. If I try to do that, tube zero equals cherries, it will give me an error. However, um, although we can't change tuples, we can still access specific values in a tuple. So instead of changing tube zero, um, I can access it by simply typing tube zero and then entering it if we're in the console or printing it if we aren't in the console. So everything we can um, do to list, we can do to a tuple, except we can't change or update a tuple. However, we can still add tuples. For example, we can create a new tuple by making it tube two equals 12 comma 14. And then we can do tube three and we can also make tube three, which we can make equal to tube plus tube two. So tube three equals tube plus tube two. And then you can delete an entire tuple, but you but not just one portion of it. So to do this, you would just do um, delete tuple. Uh, let's say we want to delete tuple three. So we can just do delete tube three, uh, which is del tube three. And that removes tube three from our code. Again, um, we can call the len function or length function. And you just type the len. So we can call the length function to see how many times we have, uh, how many items we have um, inside our tuple. So we can just do um, len parentheses tuple to get um, three because that signifies that we have three items in our tuple. And we can also do tuple times three to get um, apples, apples, apples being repeated three times. And yeah, that's basically it for tuples. Just make sure that you understand that tuples are immutable and you should be good to go other than that. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this video and thank you so much for continuing to be a part of this journey. Welcome back to the basics of Python. In this video, we'll learn conditional statements. And the most basic conditional statement is the if and else statement. If something is happening, we want a particular action to happen or else we want a different action to happen. Let me give you a practical example to help simplify things. For example, if it's raining outside, I will take an umbrella, else I will not take an umbrella. Basically, it is a condition. If the condition is true, the code will execute a particular set of commands, and if that condition is false, the code will execute a different set of commands. Now, let's start typing. Here, I'm going to write my if statement. 
I'm going to do if and then in parentheses 5 is greater than 3. Inside, this, inside the parentheses is my condition and this condition has to result in a true or false statement. The condition must get an output that is true or false. Now I will add a colon after the condition and then click enter for an indent or in the case of REPL the indent already happens if you're in the workspace. But remember if you're in the console you will have to manually indent. So far what I'm saying is if the condition 5 is greater than 3 is true then execute the code that follows. I'm going to say if the condition is true then print hello. Now you can leave the statement as is and if I click run now I will print hello. But what happens when this condition is not true? So let's make another condition if parentheses 3 is less than 2 and then colon then print hello else print false. So we'll just do else and then colon and then we'll write our prints we'll write print false and then when I enter this command or print it and if I'm in the works, workspace I will get false. One, one thing you have to be really careful in Python is indenting. Python is very picky about indents and your indents must be perfectly aligned. Your if and else statements should be indented the same way. So be careful how you indent and just as a tip you can press shift tab to go back one indent space so you don't need to go around guessing how many spaces you have to go back. And let's go back to the conditional statements. We, we use two operators here greater than and less than but there are other operators too. We have three greater than or equal to two so which we have which can be three and then you have your greater than sign and then you have your equal follow, followed by your equal sign and then two which is true and then we also have three less than equal to two which is your less than sign first and then your equal to sign and then two and this condition is false and then we have three equal equal to three so which is also true and this last one confuses many people why do we have two equal signs well, as you saw in the previous video, when we have one equal sign, we are assigning a value to a variable. So if you were to say 3 is equal to 2, Python will give us an error because it will think you're trying to make 3 a variable that is equal to 2. And that's just false. So that's why we have two equal signs to identify that we are comparing the values of something and not making it a variable. And then the last relational operator we have is the not equal to sign. For not equal to, we use an exclamation mark, and so it'll be just be 3 exclamation mark equal to and then 2. And this is also a true condition. So okay, we talked about if and else statements and the relational operators. Now let's move on to else if statements. To do this, I'm going to create an age variable. So we we'll just set age is equal to 16. Now let's say um, if parentheses age is less than 13 colon print I am young. Now I want to add my else if statement for a condition that is between 13 and 18. Else if is basically an if statement that follows another if statement. So I can say um, else if which in Python will be elif and then my condition will follow that which is going to be in parentheses age and that is going to be greater than or equal to 13 and age is less than or equal to 20 and then colon. Notice over here I said and, um, so we need both of these conditions to be true in order for us to satisfy our condition. This and basically means that we're combining both of these two conditions together and if either one of these two conditions is not met then this elif statement would be invalid. So if these two conditions are true we'll print you are a teen and then lastly I will say else colon print you are an adult. And once again Make sure you have colons after your if and else statements and that your indents are aligned properly. So now let me expand on the and part. Basically the and signifies that both conditions must be true for the code to execute. So let's say if um, parentheses 5 is greater than 3 and 2 is greater than 1, print high. And since both of these conditions are true, Python will print high. However, if one of these conditions are wrong or were to be wrong, Python will not print high. So let's do if parentheses 5 is less than 3 and then 2 is greater than 1, print high, um, then nothing will happen. However, you can also use um, an OR condition instead of an AND condition. 
An OR condition basically says that only one of the two conditions must be true for the code to execute. So I can reuse my same code and say if 5 is greater than 3 or 2 is greater than 1, print high and it will print high. Um, and it will also print high when both conditions are true, um, as we um, saw right now. But when both conditions are false, if 5 is less than 3 and 2 is less than 1, it will print high. Um, it will print nothing since neither of the conditions will have been met and it will not execute the code. And if only one of these conditions is true, so if we have 5 is less than 3, so if 5 is less than 3, and then 2 is greater than 1, and print high, um, then it will, it will print high um, because one of these conditions is true. And yeah, that's basically the the condition statements, um, conditional statements in Python, just the if and else statements for right now. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and you really learned something new today. And just keep on watching. Hello and welcome back everyone. In this video, we will be going over for loops. So with for loops, you are basically um, iterating over a sequence. So I'm going to go ahead and create a list of grocery items as we have been doing before and a tuple of numbers. Now, let's say I want to print out every single value in my list. I'm going to use a for loop. I will say um, for and then a variable name. This is basically what you want each value in your list to be. Uh, known as. So I'm just going to call it item in list one and then print item. So it'll be just be list one colon print item and then item will be in parentheses. So this code is very straightforward. I simply print every item in my list. Um, so what happens here, the for loop iterates over every item in the list. It goes to apples and then says, okay, I'm assigning the string apples to the variable item and then it prints the variable item. And then it moves on to the next portion of the list. It goes to bananas and assigns bananas to item and then prints item. And it does this for every item on this list. Now let's go to, to tuples. So I can again do for item in tuple one, colon print item. The exact same thing happens. Each number gets assigned to the variable item and then it gets printed one by one. Um, for loops are very effective in iterating over data structures. So you can also use for loops for something known as a range function, which is which I find pretty cool. A range function gives you a series of numbers starting from one index and going to another index. So most of the times when I use the range function in for loops, I use the variable i, but you can also use any variable as long as you don't forget it and you don't repeat it later. So for i in range 0, 10 in parentheses and then colon print i, so now this prints numbers from 0 up to 10. Notice how it doesn't print 10 because once again the ending position is not printed and it is excluded. So if you want to print 1 to 10 you will have to do for i in range 1 comma 11 and then colon print i to get um, 1 to 10. A cool thing about the range function is that it has a skip feature. So Let's say you only want to print out the even numbers from 1 to 10. You can do that by um, doing for i in range 0, comma 11, and then another comma and 2, and then you have your colon print i. And you get all the even numbers between 0 and 10. So the last value you put in is the number that it is skipping, um, which in our case is by 2. The last number is the increment value. So now let's do a quick challenge for you guys. Why don't you try and print out the first five multiples of 10? So you can pause the video here and then come back to check your solution. All right, once you have finished doing that, come back and let's see if you have, if you did it the same way I did. So you can do this by saying for i in range 0, comma 51, comma 10, and then colon um, print i. And boom, there you have it, the first five multiples of 10. So you can get rid of the zero if you just change the starting index from zero to one, but that's fine for me right now. And that's the basics of for loops in a nutshell. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and make sure to stay tuned for the next one.
Hello and welcome back everyone. So in this video, we'll be going over while loops. And so what are while loops? While loops are a type of loop that continue to run until a condition becomes false. They're useful when you don't know how long before a condition be becomes false. So we'll go ahead and create a counter and we'll do C equals zero. And while C is less than five co uh, colon, and again, notice how there is no parentheses for the condition this time. So once again, we'll have our colon, um, we'll say print C and then say C equals C plus one. And if we don't say that C is equal to C plus one, then our C will stay at a constant zero. And since zero will always be less than five, our code will continue to run forever because the condition will remain true forever. Um, and that will cause your computer to crash and you don't want that. So you always have to make sure that at some point the condition in your while loop becomes false. Um, simple terms, while loops are pretty straightforward. They're just loops of code that run until a condition becomes false. However, what is quite interesting are the two control statements that can be used to change the path that a loop normally takes. The first one is the break statement. And once again, let's set C equal to zero. So while C is less than five, colon print C. Now I will go ahead and say if C is equal equal to three, colon um, break. And then again, I will say C is equal to C plus one. So now if you run this code, you can see that when C becomes three, the code terminates or stops. And that is what the break statement is supposed to do. So the next statement is continue, which basically lets you skip code. So let's set C um, equal equal to three again, while C is less than five if, and then colon, if C is equal equal to three, again, don't forget our colon over here by the if statement, um, continue and then print C and then C is equal to C plus one. Now I made a mistake here on purpose, but I want you to logically understand what, I, what mistake I made. So this code is going to run properly until it reaches three. When C is equal to three, it will skip this code because it will continue over it and go back to the start. However, C will still be equal to three at the start of the code when it returns. And we're going to go into an endless loop, which you don't want in a while loop as your code will crash. Now, if I run this, you will see that the code doesn't end. I will have to manually end it. So first we have to increment C and only once we have incremented C, can we put the continue statement. So um, what, what we can do um, while C is less than five, colon C um, equal to C plus one. And then if C is equal to equal to three, the continue statement and then print C. So now we see that three is skipped when we print it out. Um, and yeah, you have to make sure that um, you're always incrementing your C before you go back to the start of your code because if you don't increment it, it'll just stay stuck on three and it'll go into an endless loop, which again, like I said, you don't want. And yeah, that's that's basically it. There you have it, the two control statements. So make sure you continue practicing uh, your while loops and your control loops and your control statements, sorry. And as knowing this will be an important part of transitioning to advanced Python. Um, but for the purpose of our video, that's it. So um, make sure you continue practicing, but see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back everyone to our Python series. In this video, we will be learning about the try and accept case in Python. So you run try and accept code when you're not sure whether you will get results or data to use in your code. This might be the case when you're calling data from a website or an app and you're not sure if the website or app has the data you need. If the code in your try part doesn't work, then it will automatically default back to your accept case. So let's take an example. I'm going to write try and then colon, and then if name is greater than three, colon print um, hello. And then I will say accept and then colon, make sure you don't, don't forget that colon, and then print the code is wrong. So I haven't defined name here. Um, so obviously this code is wrong. So when I click enter, I will get the statement in the accept part of my code that says the code is wrong. And the reason that this happens is because when, is because when Python 
it was executing the try part of this code, it realized that name is undefined, so the try part of the code is wrong, and it goes to, straight to the accept code. It's kind of like an if and else statement. Um, if the try code works, Python executes the try code, else it will execute the accept code. Now, speaking of wrong code, one thing that is important in any coding language is knowing how to comment in your code. Commenting is basically you writing notes to yourself, maybe explaining to yourself how the code works or writing ideas for how the code can be improved. Whatever it is, Python ignores um, comments, so you don't get any errors. In Python, the symbol for comments is the hash sign, which you can get by pressing shift 3. And anything you write after the hash sign will be ignored by Python when the code is run. So I can say hash, this is a comment. Now, you usually use comments in your files and not in your console, but for our purpose, it doesn't matter, matter whether you're writing in the file or in the console. Now, one thing to note is that the hash sign only allows you to do one-line comments, but if you want to do multi-line comments, maybe a paragraph explaining all of your code, you need to use three quotation marks. I can do three quotation marks and say, this is a comment, it's multiple lines, and then another three quotation marks to show Python that you have finished your comments. One thing to note when you're using REPL is that REPL will automatically give you quotation marks in pairs, so you will need to make sure you remove one quotation mark, otherwise it will give you an error. And yeah, that's all you need to learn about comments and the try and accept case for Python in today's video. So thanks so much for watching and just a few more topics and then you will have learned the basics of Python. So make sure to keep watching. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Python course. So today we will be learning about functions. Functions are the essence of coding languages and they help you reuse code and make your code more efficient overall. So let's say you're running the same code multiple times for a big project. Rewriting it over and over again is just a waste of time and energy. So what we do is we create a function and then we call that function whenever we need to use that code. And how do we create a function you might ask? When creating functions, I recommend that you do it in the file itself instead of the console. To create a function, we will use define, which is just def in Python. So you write def and then the name of your function. You can name a function whatever you want, but make sure you don't have the same name for multiple, multiple functions because that might result in compiling errors. So in this function, I'm going to print hello world and I will call this function hello world because of that. So I'll just do define, which is def, and then I'll name it hello world, and then two parentheses. At the end of every name, you also need to make sure you put in two parentheses to signify that there is some sort of parameter that goes into the function. Or if there are no parameters, the two parentheses show that it's an empty function. Right now, since our function is just a print statement, print statement we don't need to pass any parameters. And after that, um, after the parentheses, we'll need to add a colon. And then next, we'll just write print hello world. Now, nothing will happen to this function until you call it. Um, so if you just leave it like this in the workspace or even in the console, nothing will happen, nothing will print out, you won't see any any like result. And you can call a function by simply writing the name of your function, which in our case is hello world, and then the parentheses, hello world. So it'll be hello world and then parentheses. So now when we run this code, we'll get hello world in our console. So now let's get a bit more advanced. I want to create a function that takes a, in a user's name and then prints hi and then the person's name. So we'll call this function greeting. So we'll just do def or define greeting and then two parentheses. Now this time we're going to have to specify an input because this is not going to be an empty function that you can just call. In other coding languages, um, you have to specify whether your input is an integer or a string but in Python, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is write name. And then, so after the colon, we'll write um, print hi. And then the hi will be in quotation marks. And then we'll just add name and then add an exclamation mark. And then, yeah, that would be our function. So now let's go ahead and call this and let's see what happens. So we'll call greeting. And then in the uh, parentheses, we'll have Jack in quotation marks. And yeah, now we can run this to see and we'll see hi Jack with that exclamation mark. So 
based off of what you have learned so far in this video, I have a challenge for you. I want you to create an addition function that takes two numbers and then prints out the sum of those two numbers. So why don't you pause the video over here and try it out and then all we, then we can go over it together. So yeah, why don't you go ahead and pause this video right here. Okay, so um, let's see. All we have to do is define addition or we'll just call our function add. So we'll just do def add and then we'll have two inputs this time. Uh, one, first number and second number. So we'll call it num1 and num2. Make sure you separate those by a comma. And then make sure you also put that colon um, after the uh, second parentheses. And then in the next line, we'll just write print num1 plus num2. And yeah, that's all you have to do. So let's call the function. Um, we'll put in 10 and then 15. And then you should get 25 as the output. And then this function should work for any two numbers. So you can do like 100 and like 10 or whatever. Any two numbers, it should work and it should give you a proper sum. And yeah, that's basically functions in a nutshell. But before I end this video, I also want to explain a statement. And this statement is the return statement. So suppose you have a function that does addition like the one we just created. But what if you want to store that value and not print it? Um, well, we can use that return statement for that. So we'll just copy the function and then call it def and then we'll just change the name to return add and instead of print we'll have return so we'll just be return num1 plus num2 in parentheses and then now we can set a variable sum equals return add and that's how we can store the value we can just say that the sum of or that return add will be um, the value of the variable sum so we can do sum equals return add um, 12 and 34 uh, two random numbers and then we can just print sum to check that it is doing what we want to do. And yeah, that's it. It'll give you um, 34 plus 12, which is 46. So it should be um, working properly. And yeah, that's how you can store values in, in without actually having to print it out all the time. And you don't even have to do this last print um, sum. It's just for me showing you that um, the value is actually being recorded in the variable sum. And yeah, that's basically it. Functions and the return statement in a nutshell. So once again, thank you so much for watching and make sure you stay tuned for the next video. Hello and welcome everyone to the last topic of this Python course. After this topic, you will have passed the beginner phase of Python and you can continue on to the next advanced level of Python. In this video, we'll be going over the inbuilt functions of Python. Last video we talked about how you can make your own functions in Python, but Python already has a few handy functions that we will explore in today's video. Alright, so let's get straight into it. The first one we're going to cover is the absolute value function. And this is just um, abs and then parentheses. This function takes any positive and negative number and gives the absolute value of any number. So I can just do the, I can just do abs um, and then the value of like negative 34 which will just be abs parentheses negative 34 and then I'll get a return of positive 34. This function is pretty straightforward. Um, so maybe you're working on a website that is recording how many times a person went back and forth between two pictures. You don't want to store a negative value every time the person goes back. So the absolute value function comes in handy in like those sort of situations. So the next function that we're learning is the bool function. Which is basically which basically shows whether or not a statement is true or false. So the bool of zero is false, and then the bool of any true statement or like true condition is always going to be true. So you can also say that like the bool of none, if you have parentheses in the parentheses, you just write none with the end being cap the first n being capital, uh, you will also get um, false ret return. And this function is also quite straightforward. But you would want to use this in times when you're checking whether a condition is being fulfilled or not. We talked about conditional statements a few videos back and this function basically lets you know whether a condition is true or false, but doesn't really execute any additional code. And yeah, that's basically it. So let's move on. The next inbuilt function we are going to discuss is the dir function. I believe that dir is short for directory. And basically this function tells you everything you need to know about what functions you can execute with data types. For example, 
I want to know what actions I can take with a string. So I'm going to say um, dir hello, my string will be hello. So we'll just have dir and then parentheses and then quotation marks hello. And instead of hello, we could put any random string, but just hello is just what I'm going to use as an example. So basically what this function does is that it will tell me everything I can do with the string hello. And out of all of these, and then when you click enter, you'll get a list of like words. And so what all these words are is that they're just various commands that we can give to this hello string. So using the dir function is very useful when you have a specific data type and you're just trying to understand how you can use the different commands to execute um, different codes. Now you might be looking at these different actions or functions that the dir um, function is resulting in and you, could, you might be thinking how like how do you how do you know what to use and how do you know what these functions actually are? Well, there's an actually another function for that. And this one and this one is quite important to know. Um, it is the help function. So the help function is really useful because it lets you know what a function is used for. For example, let's say that you didn't know what this upper function is used for. Well, we can figure that out with the help function. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a variable called sent and then set it equal to the string hello. So sent will just be equal to this hello. Um, okay. Now what we can do is write help and then in parentheses sent.upper. And so now what this does is that you can call the help function and then you specify what is your data type, which in our case is a string that is stored in the variable sent. And then you will put a period and then after the period you'll have the function that you don't know about, which in our case is upper. And then when you click enter in the console, you'll find that you, it'll give you a description of what upper does. So here it shows that the function upper will take in a, st a string and then return the string with everything in the uppercase. So knowing how to use the help function will serve you well going in the future because you don't want to memorize every single function in Python. Just doing a quick search or calling the help function allows you to make sure that you can focus on your code instead of focusing on memorizing random functions. Yeah, and that's basically it. You've officially completed the basics of Python. So before you head out, make sure you watch the thank you video to learn more about what it is you can do to further your um, Python learning journey and your learning journey, journey in general. Um, but other, other than that, thank you for being such a great audience and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the thank you video.